thanks very much for inviting uh, me here today. I'm very grateful. I have a lot of thoughts. So yes, this is working. Am I close enough? All right. No, I was I was just full up with with feeling and gratitude for a moment. And um, what I'd like to talk about is experience rather than theory uh, or opinion. Uh, it's why I often write memoir. It's how 12-step programs get people who are deep in the well of addiction to listen. Um, experience, strength, and hope is the phrase that 12-step programs use, and I'm, I'm using it today. I borrowed it for the play, My General Tubman, and I'll borrow it as the theme for this talk, along with Harry Tubman, Love and Black Power. Workshop week at the Arden Theater about a year and a half ago was like an olive press for me. The third full draft of my play about Harriet Tubman had been copied and stacked on the table in front of each actor's chair. The actors chosen by Arden's director and co-founder, Terry Nolan, and his thoughtful associate producer were experienced, the actors were experienced and skilled. Some of them knew each other and greeted each other in happy reunion. This was a space they trusted. They looked forward to the discovery. Each of them had more theater experience than I. And yet they trusted that Arden had chosen for good reason this wacky story of Harriet Tubman traveling through time to a Philadelphia prison to find men to fight with her uh, against slavery. That's a big ask for them to trust. I mean, it, first, when you hear it, it's like, well, um, they accepted Terry Nolan's confidence that I was an olive plumped full of more of the play's potential than they might see in the flawed text before them. They read and reread and discussed. They asked me questions. They pressed and they squeezed answers out of me. I listened, I went home, I slept, I got up the next morning before dawn and squeezed and rewrote. I tried again, I rewrote the next day and the next night. I messed up and rewrote again. That week could not have happened without nearly two years of Arden co-founder uh, Terry Nolan's low impact road to confidence. As a longtime teacher of creative writing at University of Penn, I recognized early on that his encouragement was aiming to keep me working through lots of not good enough drafts toward revelation. Whenever you're teaching, of course, students say, is this it? Is this good enough yet? Is this? And you just say, well, this, keep, keep, let's see some more. Come on, let's see some more. As opposed to saying, this is really terrible. <laughs> Whoa, well, this is terrible. I don't know what they're going to do with it. You never say that, right? Because what you're trying, you, cause, because as a teacher, I don't know where this could go. All I know is that that kid is hungry, right? So that I recognize that's sort of what Terry Nolan was doing to me, thank goodness. He let me take time with my research. And even though he dropped hints along the way that theater could not be as literal as novels, which I'd written, he kept saying it's a different kind of storytelling. I said, yeah, sure, gotcha. <laughs> but how do I do it? It was during that research with a University of Penn uh, work-study student named Roshimba Llewellyn that I learned that the hard part of this drama was not going to be convincing the audience to accept the premise of Harriet Tubman's time travel, but rather the Christian expression of her spirituality. It was a lovely young woman, history major, very smart, very dear 
She loved Tubman. What she said to me was, I get that she believes in God, but I don't. So like, I can't go there with her. So how to present Harriet Tubman on her own terms, respectfully, without insulting or losing our audience? How to find words and actions? How to let an audience feel or experience a token of this love, like life and breath that animated her and made her believe she could be an instrument to make a way out of no way, <clears throat> which was the only answer for an enslaved African, because there was no way. So she had to make a way, like thousands and thousands and thousands of others. How do you do that? How do you make a way out of no way? Um, how, how do you keep doing it, which remains the question for people who are enslaved and oppressed, for people who are, as the King James Bible says, sore oppressed by other people, by the structures we create, by our own actions. How do you make a way out of no way? So that was her answer. Nolan watched and wondered about scenes where I lurched toward spectacle. He interviewed out of me my desire to create a call and response aesthetic approach to Tubman's special brilliance of spirit. I want a call and response. I want it this. <laughs> I'm gonna do it again. I wanted that call and response because I wanted the audience not just to see and observe the way she was doing, but also to feel it, to say this back and forth, because that aesthetic expression is part of the way that this particular woman and community made a way out of no way. I wanted to evoke the special brilliance of her spirit. How could we privilege connection? among actors and audience? How could we privilege connection over cleverness? How do you do that? And yes, this was an appropriate goal for this story. Alongside Harry Tubman, love and time travel and black call and response lay my love and that of the 19th century African Americans for Shakespeare's play, Henry V. Uh, Terry Nolan asked me what plays I liked. I told him various plays I love. I did August Wilson, I love this and love that. I love Night Mother, mm. and I said, and, and Henry V. And he said, whoa, you didn't see that one coming. Why, why was this play founded on that? Because I learned here at the Historical Society, the library company, that 19th century African-American drama groups <coughs> loved that play. They loved it because there was this tiny little group of people fighting against, the, they were English. I mean, we're always having to do this filter, by the way. African Americans are always having to read American and English literature, Spanish literature, whatever it is, and then work yourself into it, right? Um, but there they were, These, this small ragtag group of medieval, English uh, fighters facing thousands of fresh French regiments. That's, that's the main, that's what happens at the end of Henry V. They loved it, these black drama groups in the 19th century here in Philadelphia. They loved that St. Crispin's, Crispin's speech when Henry V says, when all these people say, oh boy, I wish we just had a few more people from England. Oh, if only we could have that. And Henry V comes out and says to them, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers. <laughs> you want to you try to finish it, right? Yeah, for he who fights with me this day is for me my brother. Be he near so, what is it? He ne'er so something this day will gentle his condition. 
right? We, we bunch. We love saying those words because they were just a few and they were up against all of America. Nolan gave me permission, permission meaning he didn't tell me I could, but gave, helped me have the confidence to lay that play in all of its hints and tricks under my own play as a sort of scaffolding. And when I put that scaffolding there, I was also in my mind scaffolding the play with the spirit of those drama groups that did their own plays, did their own workshops throughout Philadelphia in the 1800s. It gave me also the model of a narrator whom I used to help viewers keep their bearings at first and then to loosen their grip on bearings altogether. Um, putting a narrator in a modern play, I thought, uh, it's kind of old fashioned, it's kind of corny. It's, and then I had to let go of all those, which is essentially aesthetic pride, and just tell the story you want to tell and tell it the way you want to tell it without trying to be cool or ironic. Um, I used that narrator to help bring people back and forth between past and present and among different characters. This exploration let me set into the middle of this fantastic setting a tender love story of Harriet Tubman and her second husband. She was in her 40s, he was in his 20s. We don't tell that story very much. We don't let her have her full life. Only then could I lay out the insistent and glorious spirituality of Harriet Tubman for the actors to evoke. It was that personal love that let me find ways for her to talk about the bigger loves in her life. The actors took to it like angels who bring to us the whisper of transcendence over the obscene legacy of chattel slavery. Love in the midst of hatred, in the midst of loss, like a song against evil and death. Also, let me use the metaphor of a muse, and let me decide to use, thought, uh, use water for the muse for Harriet Tubman, she who grew up around the Chesapeake Bay, she who was sent at seven years old to grab muskrats from their traps barefoot at seven in the water, dragging home dead carcasses of muskrats. She who um, worked with her father and all of these lumbering people in Chesapeake Bay and understood water and boats and used a very small skiff to get her niece Keziah out from behind the auction pen in Baltimore to sneak her and her children and row them very quickly upstream. Water instead of fire. Henry V comes out and says, oh, for a muse of fire. Because I want to tell you the muse of fire. Instead, my narrator comes out and says, take water for our muse, where our black past has dissolved. Take vapor and black storm clouds raining down on us through time. Drink it in. Before she renamed herself Harriet Tubman, seven year old Araminta, barefoot in the cold Chesapeake Bay, sets free muskrats that she's told to drown in their traps. During preview week, um, this amazing young director, I'm old enough now so that everybody in their 30s is really young. <laughs> My amazing young director. Uh, James Imes, who directed last year at the Arden Gem of the Ocean, uh, is a, a theater um, teacher at Villanova, writes his own plays, has been an actor, he's just brilliant. Uh, James said to me, he said, I think, I think we're there, I think we're almost there. He said, but the audience is still scared to really, you know, we've done some call and response, but it doesn't happen until later. And I think we need, right in the prologue, to tell the audience about Tubman. Tubman was funny. She was, she had, she had a wonderful wit and brilliance, all different kinds of humor, not just one kind. 
Um, but we also don't tell that of her, so people get in and they feel, <coughs> she said something funny, but it's Harry coming, I don't want to laugh. Because maybe that would make it not serious. So we wrote into, I wrote into the prologue, uh, she sets free muskrats she's told to drown in their traps and laughs because nothing is more joyous than freedom cutting through water from then to this stage. Come, fight with her, walk, fly, love. It's a play. Y'all can laugh. Laugh with the general because she lives. Time ripples around her, drummed out of time by the necessity, by black necessity. Tubman's gravity pulls, and time bends now. The idea that she is there in the middle, and that time is bending around her, as we've learned about from physics. One man told me that he laughed, but he fussed all weekend that he'd been let off the hook. Which brings us to the subject of white American guilt. Although the point of this play, the point of all the speeches, the aspects of black expression, the point of the drumming, which is to get into your cells and reset the brain, the point of this is to say that she is the focus, not white American guilt. It is her time for this two hours. Not us, not guilt, not worry that she will be what we are most concerned about. Not as I've heard all my life, not primarily, not more importantly, not in the large sense, whiteness and privilege. Studied now as an academic discipline as it has been for more than 30 years. But the fact is that guilt is there, isn't it? Like all audience responses, it's something that the play has to take into account, has to use, has to acknowledge and respect. Minal Bopaya, writing for NPR, described it thus. He says, in my mind, whiteness comes down to a collection of physical characteristics such as skin color, eye color, hair color, texture, that have been deemed either the default or the most desirable by our society. <laughs> to identify as white is to be indoctrinated into the belief that you are the norm, that your experience is central, that other, anything else is other. Whiteness allows white people to feel a sense of ownership over this country, while anyone non-white is made to feel like a visitor, or in the case of Native Americans, a displaced person. Anahasi Coates says that this sense of ownership is why white Americans struggle when they are told they cannot say the N-word in rap music. Now, maybe you don't listen to a lot of rap. Maybe you don't, I mean, here in the ethical society, I don't think anybody's going to fight me to be able to say the N-word. But 60%, sometimes more, of white boys in the suburbs listen to rap music and feel that they own it and that they are quite capable of and should be allowed to say whatever that music says. To be white, he says, is to believe that all rights are afforded to you, even while you deny rights to others. To be white is to believe everything can be owned by you. Uh-uh. <laughs> The other reason it's difficult to talk about whiteness is because it requires talking about privilege. As Peggy McIntosh begins her seminal essay on this topic, Unpacking the Invisible Backpack, many white people were, quote, taught to see racism 
only in individual acts of meanness and uh, rather not in invisible systems conferring dominance on, my, on, on any group. To admit to systematic advantage goes against the core of American society and American mythology, that we are a meritocracy where if someone works hard, they have a shot. All of this rode in a sidecar of our understanding as the Arden invited the extraordinary director, um, James Imes, to, to come into this work. In order to get there, I spent two years still wrestling with portraying the magnitude of the love of Tubman and figuring out how to do it in a way that doesn't seem weak, hmm? which is also part of the narrative we have. How to do it, um, how to do it and show the strength of it. Tubman described coming that love uh, and particularly spiritual love, the love of God, came to her during her spells of temporal lobe epilepsy. Um, contracted about 12, when a man threw a two pound weight in a dry goods store, aiming at a young guy next to her, also enslaved, aiming it at him, telling her to grab him. And of course, her being her, and her saying, no, I'm not gonna grab him so you can hit him. He threw the weight, it didn't hit the boy, it hit her, it hit her in the skull, it made a dent, it was crushed in her skull. Um, and after that, she managed to live. They put her back in the field three days later. Um, after that, she said about a month later that she felt um, that she was riding on a cart, and she was about 12 and a half, and she heard music. Um, she described it a couple ways. She said music tumbling from the sky or music as filled all the sky. She also said that after that, she would sometimes, during these spells, fly over towns and fields. And she said, third, that sometimes she would be allowed to touch the mind of God. That was her experience of, of these spells. This um, mysticism of hers really does talk to people, the poetry and the mysticism of it. Um, and as I, as I told them that, the actors um, understood it, they felt it, and at the same time, the great sky that she was seeing was also reflected, as it is in all of our lives, in the tiny little puddles. Right? The great sky is reflected in a puddle of piss on the ground. So we have both in our lives. Romantic love seemed to be the way in to the mysticism. And that love, like the love of family and friends, feels to me more like water, like rain, like mist soaking into the earth. Like that water we said was our muse. Her power, it seemed to me, came from that and from keeping her priorities clear, keeping her eye on the prize, as the old spiritual said. When she led the Combahee River raid, the only woman in the Civil War to lead an expedition in that war, her aim was to get supplies, free enslaved people, and undercut the confidence of the South by doing so, without provoking the kind of violence that she knew, that she saw, that was everywhere, and the kind of violence that would have, without a doubt, have claimed its first victims in the very enslaved people they were trying to free. She knew that. So therefore, her St. Crispin speech did not have the blood that Henry V said. Hers said, Who's that wants more men or more guns? What for us few, exhausted, hungry, black and blue from scouting, searching, spying, hiding? Do we need more guns 
and men to set freedom free. We have crawled on our bellies through time itself to do this new thing together. Yes, there's danger. Yes, we have to steamboat through the rebels' territory to take back the truth that there is no such thing as a slave. Only guns and greed, lies and greed, and men who eat children and wonder why they're sick. One of the English department professors spoke directly to me about what I would call love in Harriet Tubman's black power. This woman called it a gathering up of our moment our moment, where we are in this country now, and placing it in the continuum. Some people keep talking about this is the worst time, this is terrible, this is the... Placing this moment where we are into the continuum, or rather placing the continuum back into our present, a present so large and made of so many doors. And often we don't see them because we're directed by anger, by hate, by power, by money, to look through one door. But there are others. All the registers in it. The funny and devastating, not giving each other enough time to breathe, which happens in our own lives. Certainly happened in Tubman's. Time lifted up lightly and firmly to show how it sits with us, in us, on us, but how we also help carry each other through it. All of us together, through our lives, through our conflict together. Love first and always. It kept Tubman poor, by the way, all her life. It's one of the reasons why we don't tell the rest of her story. Because unlike all of the characters we love in Dickens, she never got money. She never got wealth and power. So we ignore the half that doesn't seem triumphant. And into that first half of her bringing out those people from slavery, we add, we emphasize, we overemphasize Tubman and the gun. The gun. The story we tell about her with that gun, the people who were afraid, and how she said, you know, you're not going back. As if black cowardice were her fault not slavery, because we love to tell the story of black cowardice. So we enlist her in it, as if these people who were carrying babies on their back, who had paragoric to keep the children quiet, as if those people were not the most courageous ever. Tubman and her second husband, Nelson Davis, um, also stayed poor even though they had a brick-making business, raised chickens, sold eggs, raised hogs. There is a lot of hogs, by the way. And one time in their city of Auburn, there were new pesticides that people made to get rid of fleas and stuff in their houses. And when Harry Tubman and her husband collected the garbage, the pesticide was in the garbage, killed all of her hogs. There was a nasty, mean-spirited little um, article in the Auburn paper that made fun of that fact, by the way. We don't tell those stories because we don't like telling the story of poverty, because we don't like telling the story that you can do the best you want to in America. You can fight, you can work, you can do everything, and still remain poor, still remain homeless, still remain oppressed. We don't like that story because it means that it undercuts the story of the upper middle class of the middle class. It undercuts our, faith, our flawed uh, talk about meritocracy in this country. After Nelson Davis died, his war pension, when Congress finally gave it to union veterans and then finally gave a lower one to black union veterans, his pension was finally the first regular money she had ever gotten from the government of the United States for her war service. Later, he took an act of Congress to add to that pension so that her $12 a month from him was added to by $8 for her being a, a spy, a leader of an expedition, a nurse, 
etc. to make 20. I don't know if that's why they decided maybe her they should be on a $20 bill, but that was her pension. Love first kept her from spending energy hating, feeling superior, resenting, punishing, getting revenge, all of which would have been justified, all of which would have been much more American, all of which would have kept us from forgetting this second half of her life. But all of them drain life out of people, like dysentery in the second in the Civil War drained life out of soldiers. There was a general, by the way, who was dying of dysentery. He said, get me Harriet Tubman. He's a white general. He said, get me Harriet Tubman now. Please now, while I'm still alive, she came with her crazy herbs and her stuff that smelled like swamp and made him drink it, and, uh, and he lived. Love first kept her from power as we in America like to see it, but it also kept her 